Hey, Louise. Hi there, Yannick. So we're here for the Create Interactive Meeting Apps for Microsoft Teams uh, Learn Live module uh, for Microsoft Build. Are you excited? I'm super excited to be here, super excited to be co-presenting with you and actually learning something and empowering even more people to build more cool stuff. Well, let's hope so. so <laughs> let's hope so, right? Would you start to introduce yourself or is it ladies first tonight? Well, it's ladies first, apparently, because you're the first <laughs> on the slides. OK, so hi there. My name is Louise Fraser. Um, I'm from Germany. I'm a Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Consultant, an MVP for Office Apps and Services, member of the um, Microsoft 365 Platform Community uh, team, where I empower more developers to extend M365. Uh, I love all things community, graph, stickers, my favorite number is 42. And of course, you can find me on Twitter and on GitHub. Uh, just by my name, Louise Fraser. And um, now it's time for Yannick to introduce himself. Yannick, well, who are a, you? Well, that's a lot. It looks like uh, you you do a lot of things. I do a lot of things, actually. That's true. See, what about my, you? List is a, my list is a lot shorter. So I'm Yannick Eekmans. I'm a Microsoft Solution <laughs> Architect at Cubix in Belgium. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, but in Office, uh, in office Development. Um, I'm a developer by heart. And I ask the important questions like, uh, do we really need custom development? And also, where is the coffee? Because a developer turns coffee into code, right? Um, so you can also <laughs> find me on so. Twitter. Yeah, so that's what we say. So you can find me on Twitter and on GitHub. Um, so all my stuff is there. See what I built. So have you uh, forked one of my repositories lately? Uh, I, I did. I did, actually. OK, did you like it? Oh, oh, well, we can discuss this later, right? <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, let's go. So today, we're um, apparently covering the Create Interactive Meeting Apps for Microsoft Teams Learn module. So um, this means that we will go through all of the learning objectives and important stuff that's part of that Learn module. And every one of our attendees, um, viewers, can go and complete the learn module by themselves. Exactly. And for that, we uh, kindly present you with this uh, QR code. So you can scan this. You can do this while we are presenting. You can do this afterwards as well. But uh, I highly recommend to really take some time and to actually complete that learn module. Um, and also, it is a great opportunity to just like gain more skills because uh, right at uh, being uh, uh, here at Build, we have this beautiful cloud skill challenge. And that means you're just a one time and then you learn about stuff in your own pace. And of course, we will help you with that, just like with this uh, session here at Build. And after that, you get a voucher to get uh, an exam. So that means that you can just like prove that you gained new skills. And that is, of course, super beneficial for everyone. Well, that sounds super exciting. And right. if you finish this Learn module, you will also have built your first meeting application that runs inside Microsoft Teams. So you will end up with an exact working application that can do a thing or two uh, while being in a meeting in Teams. Now, just to be clear, since this is just an hour long, well, this session is um, <laughs> just an hour long, we decided to make sure that we get the most value out of it. So Louise, what will we be covering? So if you would present us with the next slide, that would be already valuable. Um, oh, yeah. We, of course, want first. So we yes, we have learning objectives, but we all want our attendees to say hi. So please use the chat, say hi, tell us where you're from, what you want to learn. Uh, please ask a lot of questions. So we are hungry for uh, for questions. And we want all to hear them. And of course, we want to answer them as well. As well. And we're all just like a little bit tired of online sessions. So please make sure that this is truly an interesting interactive experience and don't be shy. So uh, that would be very, very nice. And we have some learning objectives um, for you. And uh, we would love to show you what we have in, um, in this case for you today. Yeah, so before we switch that, I also want to uh, thank the moderating team that's in the background because they will be answering all of the questions in the chat. It's not us, you're not directly chatting to us, but uh, every interesting question will be coming up live on this uh, like session. Um, so they will pass them through to us. So let's exactly. see, in terms of learning objectives, 
I don't think we kept the slide really. So it's um, <laughs> it's all the way through okay. to okay. what is Microsoft <laughs> what Teams. Is, what is Microsoft Teams? So if we want to build an app that lives inside of Microsoft Teams, it would be a cool idea to know what actually is Microsoft Teams. And at Microsoft, everyone says, yeah, Teams, that is the hub for collaboration. And for some people that might be just like a little bit diffused or unclear, so what is Teams? It allows users to communicate and collaborate and work together with less context switching. So, you know, when you have- Sounds like, a little bit marketing-y. Right. Yeah, it sounds a little bit marketing-y, so, um, and I promise we do not do the entire uh, session marketing-y thingies, uh, but we will actually build stuff. Still, it is very important to understand that everything is about the right context to present a certain content in. And this also, of course, applies to meetings, because when we have a meeting and we need to access content and we need to engage with content, then we do not want to be um, drowning in content, but we we only want to be presented with the content that is actually valuable in the context of that meeting. Uh, because otherwise, we will be searching and context switching, and then the focus is gone and the energy is gone as well. And therefore, this is really, really um, a good idea to only present the content within oh, the right context. Oh, but I love my seven windows open and and switching between them in meetings and never finding what I want. <laughs> so I'm super productive that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I heard I heard about your productivity. That is always sweet. <laughs> so um, I have a different idea. So um, we can uh, we can move along here. So. Microsoft Teams is really about the content in the context. And today we will be caring about the context of a Teams meeting. So this is not about all the channels and the work in the Teams uh, itself, but it is about the meetings that we have day to day. And for me, from my taste, way too many uh, in Microsoft Teams. And now we have the learning objective. Now we have Finally, the learning so objective. Someone might have changed the order of the slides, and I'm not looking at anyone in particular here. It wasn't me, for sure not. <laughs> that is uh, that's very cool. So we already covered somehow. So what is what? So we will be covering. So that was just that the introduction. What are Teams apps and what are Teams in meeting apps? So because there is a difference, and not every Teams in meeting app is, of course, um, or not every Teams app is an in meeting app, but um, the other way around. Then we want to understand what is single sign-on and why would we even care about that. And the last thing that I would really like you to understand is context, role, and meeting information in a Teams meeting. So we're going just like from super marketing-y to really uh, deep techy to um, have the ability to build beautiful looking and um, context-aware uh, Teams applications. And there will be code, right? No, there, it's there, important there will, to me. There, there, there will be code. There will, there, there will definitely be code. Okay, so if you want to follow along, please use this uh, beautiful short link or the nice QR code so that you have uh, the repo with every um, resource. So you can build this from scratch. You can cheat like a little bit if you are up for it or if you are not sure, am I doing this correctly? Um, then we will help you with all kinds of resources and you find this at um, aka.ms slash learn life teams repo or use and the QR code. Yes, and it's not just the... Um, the 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 code that's there the application will be there in three steps so uh because the learn module takes you through three exercises to build this uh this application so after each uh, um, exercise the finished code will be put on the repository in github but it, there's also a screencast available um that is basically something what we're doing now live but uh done by the creator of the learn module exactly so, so what are what? Microsoft Teams apps, Louise? Go ahead. Yeah, well, that is a very good question, right? So what is a Teams app? Actually, there is no such thing as a Teams application because the Teams application it consists of basically three things. It is an Azure AD app registration so that our app gets an ID in the cloud. Secondly, yes. it is a website or web services hosted somewhere. Um, so there are 
more or less good places to host this app, but we need to host it will it, it will be in Azure, right? It, yeah, it has it will to be, be in Azure. It, it, it will be in Azure. So, but um, today uh, we will do that. And of course, we will need to tell teams also, where is this app? And what does it do? So where shall it be displayed? And we do this in um, a manifest file. So this is a JSON file and it only contains some metadata. So we actually uh, can tell the Teams client where this app lives and um, what it does and some, 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 some other metadata around that. And also we have two images just to have some icons to um, so that users can click on that. And that all together makes up a Teams app. And as you can see in this um, beautiful illustration here, there are lots of apps that, will, that we could build uh, for Teams. So we have adaptive cards and tabs and bots and messaging extensions, and just like a whole lot of bunch stuff. We today will only focus on the in-meeting application. So we will not build um, 20,000 apps, but only one uh, in less than one hour. And um, the in-meeting app, it's a beautiful thing because we all suffer from having too many meetings. And if we then have the content that we actually need, that would be highly appreciated. So let's yeah. move on. And yes, and, if, and once once uh, you've you've created an in meeting application, it's super easy, right, to move on to the other workloads. Um, it is actually because um, there are just like concepts that apply to the other ones as well. So if you master that, um, it will be quite pleasant for to do the other ones as well. Awesome. So ne next up is. Now, what is a Teams in meeting app? So we already covered what are Teams apps. Okay, so we can do a lot of stuff and it needs to be hosted somewhere. It has a zip file. Inside of that zip file, we get two images for the icons and we have this manifest file which contains the metadata. But what is so special about an in meeting app? Well, I'm sure you're going to tell me now. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, on the uh, edge of my seat. So go ahead. Yeah. I love to do that. So next slide, please, Yannick, because I, I brought today my colleague Yannick just so that he could just like move the slides. Yeah, so we let the, we let him write code sometimes as well, but don't tell anyone. So it's my added value. Exactly. So what is an e-meeting app? It runs in the context of that team's uh, meeting, and it really gives everyone a place to collaborate pre-meeting during that meeting and post meeting. And that, of course, is super valuable, even when we have those hybrid scenarios uh, where we really need just like a place to collaborate before that meeting took place or will be taking place. Because where would I put the information that I will need for that meeting? Will I create a notebook then and then just send that around? Or will I deal with text messages? So that is not a good idea. But we really want to have this in the context of that meeting. And usually, um, this uh, this meeting app is then implemented as a tab, and mostly, and Yannick will uh, elaborate a little bit on that. We will need a bot as well to run this. Yeah. If you want to do this properly, you need a tab and a bot. Yeah. During the learn module, there. Well, we'll cover that yeah. later. But there is a way, or we found a way to only build a tab, but it comes with a couple of downsides and a little bit of risk. So let's see. It's uh, exciting, right? So <laughs> once we hit that, you'll know why a bot is necessary. OK, that is uh, that is fair enough. So um, I would want you to understand some uh, concepts that apply to Teams in meeting apps. First is the meeting life cycle. So as already shown or as already talked about, we have a meeting that takes place somewhere. And before it takes place, of course, we have a pre-meeting. So the experience that users have before this meeting takes place. Now we so have and what 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 will we do there in that oh, 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 pre-meeting oh, oh. space? It, it, so it, it could be anything. We have a use case where we want users um, to give the ability to um, create um, stand-up topics that should be discussed then during the meeting, which means, I mean, we all suffer from meetings that do not have a certain kind of direction, that do not have an agenda, where the purpose of that meeting is totally unclear, the roles in that meetings are not clarified, so that mostly, perhaps, we don't know, they're not irrelevant to um, a lot of 
attendees. So it would be a cool idea to have this upfront so that I know, hey, that is just like not relevant to my work. So I will not attend or this is super relevant to my work. So I will happily attend and rather postpone something else. I almost um, thought you were going to say it depends. <laughs> it depends on your application. It's it's very true. It always depends. But as I did not bring my swear jar today for the it depends uh, response, I will rather not do that. Okay. And then we take the pre-meeting experience. And when the meeting goes um, live during the meeting and all my uh, 25 colleagues are in the meeting, we get a different experience. So that's the exactly. in-meeting experience of our application. And of course, after the meeting, you want some tracking. So that's the post-meeting experience. And during the meeting, there are some roles. So which are those, Louise? So, of course, we have the organizer and we all know that once you created a meeting, you can't move that role from yourself to another one and pass that on and say, hey, Yannick, I don't want to care about this meeting anymore. So now it's your turn and now you become the organizer of that meeting. That is not going to happen. So we have that role of the organizer. The organizer is always uh, that user who created that meeting. So if I send the invite, I'm the organizer, right? That's yes, the exactly, idea. exactly, okay. exactly. That's the idea. Then we have the presenter. Presenter, or as the name almost implies, are allowed to present. So share the screen and um, and stuff like that. And of course, they don't need to be the organizer. They can be the organizer. So even organizers may present, um, but there is a different role called presenter, and those can present. And last but not least, we have the regular attendee. They can listen, they can even talk, but um, they can't present unless we upgrade them um, to being a presenter. And of course, they can't change the role to be an organizer as well, because organizer is only the one who created that meeting. Can an attendee upgrade themselves to be a presenter? <sighs> well, no. Oh, that's unfortunate. I don't uh, yeah, get why. Well, I don't get yeah. why people always make me an attendee, but yeah. uh, well, I, I I get that, but <laughs> I, get I want that, to upgrade but, myself. <laughs> yeah, that is a lovely idea, but it doesn't make any sense. So if um, users could upgrade themselves, then roads would not be anyhow um yeah necessary so um it wouldn't serve any purpose anymore so what we want to do with the role is restrict permissions like restricting what a user is allowed to do uh for okay. reasons and if i would I... invite you to meeting i would just like make sure that you're an attendee yeah i get that it happens a lot don't get why yeah. and then yeah. there's lately uh, the last thing that's very important when you're building a, a teams meeting application yeah. it's uh the type of users that you're getting like your coworkers, they are, <laughs> yeah, your coworkers, they're in tenant. They exist as an account in the same tenant as your own account. So that's easy. They um, live in the same Azure Active Directory. So basically they can have a similar experience. Then you've got those guest users. Those are invited into your tenant and they can also join meetings. Then you've got the federated users. That's uh, all of those users where you have a connection with um, a federation between the two Azure Active Directories. And then the anonymous users, those that join your meeting without logging in. Um, it does not That's happen a lot. Right? <laughs> yes, but it means as well that if you, that you have to take care of four types or you have to be aware of four user types when you create your application because it would be a little bit annoying if functionality is exposed to an anonymous user but it does not work for an anonymous user right so it's yeah. important that we take this into account but that means that if we have three meeting um life cycle stages and three roads and for user types that we can create a lot of experiences just in an in meeting app right and it has a lot of take a lot yeah it has a lot of flexibility you can yeah. tailor made a pre-meeting experience to a presenter and another for an organizer and, and even go different for a federated user versus a guest user so you can create an experience for each of those user types and all the roles and the um, the timing we are in the meeting life cycle to give the best experience to the users of your application. See? That sounds super complex, is it? Well, it's 
It is and it isn't. Of course, um, you can make it easy and do pre-meeting versus uh, for all three roles, the same thing. Uh, and for all the user types, the same thing. And then you only have one uh, UX or UI for pre-meeting and one for in-meeting and one for post-meeting. It's only when you go into detail and you want to um, change it or adjust it then for, for a role or for a meeting lifecycle or user type. And if you make many, many com uh, com combinations, then it may end up complex. But we'll see yeah. later about that, right? We, we, we will see just like a little bit. So talking about Let, meeting life cycle. Well, yeah, let's see. <laughs> well, let's see where meeting a life cycle takes us, right? So we talked about yeah. this before. So um, it's time for some screenshots. So at least you know what this looks like. So pre-meeting, you know, when you go in Teams into your calendar and you plan um, a meeting, you most probably did one this week, right? So you know where okay. this goes. Yeah, only one. Um, <laughs> only, oh, you, uh, only one meeting. Can I? <laughs> only, only one meeting this week. It's this one. So um, when you create an item in your agenda, you can open it up and see all the details. And uh, now you can use the plus sign, the same way you add a tab to a team. You can now add an app to a meeting. And this is where it is the pre-meeting experience. So before the meeting, it will show in, an, in a tab um, inside this uh, item that shows all the meeting details. And you can create a UI there for your application. If we then move on to the in-meeting, there you have two options. You have the big stage, so you can put your application uh, like a, a full screen and share it with uh, the attendees of your uh, um, of your meeting, as well as a side panel, which basically shows opens the app just for you um, as a side panel on the right side, where you also have the chat or the uh, attendees uh, of your meeting, and. I believe that today at Build, it has been announced that there will be a additional functionality for this stage to add, um, to work with, with the, the loop component type so you can have interactive stage, not just a presented stage, but you can interact with the application that's happening on stage. So that's super exciting. Um, it's super new as well. So it is today new, which is why we are not going to demo that. But uh, we are super excited about this. And uh, I, I, I think that I will try this out very, very soon. Yeah, for sure. And then post meeting, you want to show something different, right? So the meeting ended. Uh -huh. So we want to know the votes on the uh, topics that we did, or you want to see what the participation rate was. So you want to not show just the topics that you had, but you want to show uh, something that's relevant after the meeting, like the participation uh, rate. Exactly. Okay. So let's see if we can demo the stand up agenda meeting app that we created. Let me see. Well, this is not the screen that I wanted. Wow. So we built this application. Well, we already did this for sure. Our attendees will do this right after this uh, presentation, right? And they will go through it. And we want to show what this is. So I've got two meeting items on my um, calendar. Let's take one in the future first. It's happening tomorrow. If I double click and open it, you see that I've got all of the normal meeting information, but I also got the plus sign where I can add a tab. So I've got my stand-up agenda application. I will not do this now because otherwise it will create a duplicate and I already added this one. When I open this pre-meeting for the one in the future, you see there's already two topics. I was very creative. So Louisa, oh, yeah. if, we do, <laughs> if we do a presentation, what topic would you like to cover? Um, so I would like to do the um, a brainstorming of ideas. Let me see if I can type while you talk and we're live on stage. This is always yeah, a challenge. Yeah, so, uh, so I can't type my name when I'm presenting. So when someone is watching, so I'm already impressed. So brainstorming on ideas and I would like to take some time on um, evaluating feedback. Important, right? To check all the feedback. So Checking let's put it on the agenda. Super Very important. Good. 
So we've got our topics on the agenda. So what's now important? I'm logged in as the um, organizer of this meeting. It's just the easier way. But if you log in as an attendee, they are also allowed to add topics to the agenda. But they cannot approve their own topics, of course. It has to be, they have to be approved by the organizer. Luckily, I'm the organizer. So I just put all and my topics on the agenda. Right now. <laughs> See? So I'll just approve my own topics. I have to deselect this one and then I can approve. So now we've got four, four, four topics on the agenda. So this means that if I call into this meeting, this is going to be a challenge because we're recording on a different um, tool. So this is why we're purposefully not using audio nor video because also it is not required. But as we can see, this stand up agenda app is still here. It is in the meeting. And if we now select this. <sighs> dum, 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 dum. There are you topics. Can see the topics are there and you can see by whom they were um they were created and there's also just like a tell if they were already presented or not and yes um it's uh yannick's a very very uh creative ideas and um my real world examples um which we now can see here in the side panel so the meeting can stay uh, um can stay like it is and we are doing this uh in meeting experience in the side panel which is pretty cool i think and yeah and the side panel is just for me as a user so yeah. if someone else would join so i'm the only one in the meeting it's going to be a very interesting meeting now evaluating About the, the feedback. feedback right yeah yes. I, I i i guess so also the brainstorming of ideas will be very nice um as you are very alone in this meeting but there well, is I... something that really is important about being alone in a meeting and um, meet in meeting applications. So you can be alone in the meeting and still access um, an in meeting app that you created before. What you can't do is create just like an appointment, just like a non meeting that has no attendee. So you are you still need at least one other attendee. And only then you can get this plus sign where you can actually add an application to your meeting. And it might be that you stumble upon that if you build an in-meeting app. So that is something that you really need to do. And one does not think about this because, yeah, I created that. And then the plus sign is not there because that's only there. So also built-in apps can only be added if you have at least one other attendee apart from you being the organizer. Yeah, great. Good to know. Um, it's a different experience, right? The team's, um, what shall I say? The team's calendar does not totally behave like the Outlook calendar. And it's a, uh, an, it's a nice change of scenery to get to know all the quirks and specialties of each of those yep. applications. Yep. Now, next up in our agenda. So we've got the side panel, which is only shown to me. Anybody else in the meeting will not see the side panel. Um, mm -hmm. But imagine that we're all 25 of us in this meeting and we want to follow along with the agenda. Now, you could share your screen, but you could also present the application. So there is this, you see, there's this button that looks like the share button to share your screen but it's scoped to the side panel. And if you click it, it will move all of the information onto the screen. And then if there would be more presenters, we could have columns for each of those uh, topics for each of those presenters. And you see that my two topics are already presented. Um, and then there are two topics that still haven't presented. And this is what I mean with the, there's no live update if I do like, mark topic one as presented, this will not necessarily update um, this stage. You should stop sharing and then share again. And this is hopefully solved with the new functionality that's coming up really, really soon to have live stuff going on. Yeah, right? so uh, loop will be a massive improvement for that. But still, I find it already pretty cool that we can now bring in content that is only relevant in this meeting to this meeting without having to just like open another app and then share this and then can you see my screen and all of that. But um, just like bringing in the right content to the right people in the right context. Yes, and then I opened up the uh, past meeting and you see that it will show just the topics 
it's no longer showing the add a topic because it makes no sense for a uh, meeting that already ended before. So it shows just what has been put on the agenda and what has been discussed so we can follow along um, when we come back to this meeting, uh, like in a couple of weeks. Okay, um, let me switch back to, well, no, not, we're not switching back. We now will cover the prerequisites because there are some prerequisites. Are we now actually building things and do well, we we're stop talking marketing about it? Well, we stop talking marketing about it, but we still will need a, a, a set of prerequisites on your machine to actually work with this uh, or to actually be able to build uh, all of this. Now, let me put, oh, my slides are not moving. So that's not easy. So anyways, so what we will need in terms of tooling is a whole set of um, uh, tools installed in your machine. So first of all, we go with Node.js. It has to be at least version 12 or higher. We will need NPM, which is Node Package Manager. And this is needed to download packages from the Node uh, repository or the package repository. But funnily enough and easily enough, every that version of Node.js. Node yeah. It comes with Node.js. Then you need Gulp CLI, Yeoman, which is a, uh, a tool to scaffold code. And then you need the Yeoman generator for Microsoft Teams, Visual Studio Code, and ng-rock. ng-rock being the tunneling, because it's super, um, or, well, it's not so easy to do the, def, uh, the, de, uh, the coding experience, the developer experience for an in-meaning application or for any Teams application is not super simple because you will need um, you, you, as a developer, you will want to create your code locally and see the changes, but to get your application running inside Microsoft Teams, it has to run on a domain and to run on a domain, you need to put it in Azure or any other, uh, hosting sure. mecha uh, mechanism. Um, but luckily there is this ng rock, um, tool that will do, uh, tunneling so that you can expose your local host with a domain and mine will be something like uh, uh build meeting apps uh dot ngrock.io or something like that so um if you surf to that link you will hit the uh the code that's running now live on my computer so in terms of prerequisites it's easy to check what you have you can do this on windows i prefer to do this on windows subsystem for Linux, it's just my way of containerizing. why, Yannick. Tell us from your experiences why you find this so superior. Because uh, when I ask Yannick and he said, are you doing this on Windows even? And I was like, yeah, I do. And then he was educating me. So um, Yannick, do the talk again. Why well, would I Why would I care? Where it runs? Well, when yeah, Windows Subsystem for Linux is basically a full Linux installation that runs on your Windows. So you get all the added advantages of running Linux, but you don't have to really switch out of Windows. So you can stay into Windows, but you can run all of your Linux stuff. And you want to run some things in Linux because Node.js and NPM are created uh, specifically for Linux and the performance of those tools is significantly better in uh, Linux. And since I don't want a separate computer or laptop to carry around with just Linux on it, I do the next best thing and I install Ubuntu on my Windows 10 machine because I'm still on Windows 10, right? So, yeah, um, same here. <laughs> so let's see when we, uh, so we need node installed. So let me check what version of node I have. Was it what we needed? At least 12. So you can At see. At least 12. I'm running 14.15.1, so that looks to be okay. Um, I also use a, a cool tool called NVM, which stands for Node Version Manager, because normally you can only install one version of Node.js in your environment. And that leads to really a lot of trouble and just like installing stuff again, because sometimes we need different versions 
regarding what we're actually building. So if we do SPFX, we need another version than if we do Teams. And uh, we do not want to constantly deinstall and then install again. So it is a really, really cool tool that allows you to have separate, uh, several uh, versions of Node installed, and then you manage these versions and can just like easily switch between of them. And, so let's um, see show, show, which show ones I have... Show off. <laughs> yeah, let's see which ones I got installed. It's always a, um, a surprise. Well, it's already not working, which is great. So let's see what I've got. I've got eight, three, two versions of Node 10, one of 12, one of 14, and one of 16. And you see that the V14 is active. You could switch now to use, for example, V16.13.1, which I will not do because I will break the next demo. But it will switch the version of Node to that specific version. Um, okay. So that's that. And then you need a couple of other things. Um, and you can check with npm list global to see what's installed on your environment and if you've got everything. So let's see what happens now. This is now thinking. And then we'll drop a big list of all of the dependencies. And you see, you there don't are know a lot, what's... right? <laughs> Yeah, that's because basically I think I've got about four packages installed globally, but it also shows the full um, dependency list. So it shows all the packages that it's all that those four packages that I installed need. So let's see if we limit the that to zero, and then normally show me just be... less. Show me only what I need to know. I do not want to see all of that stuff. So it's now again thinking, and I hope it will show that I've got see. Um, Yo Teams installed and the generator for Teams installed, which is very important. I also got NPM installed and I see I've got the CLI for Microsoft 365 installed and the generator for SharePoint. So if we are tired of building in meaning applications, I can start building a web part for SharePoint. Okay. So this is all dependencies. We've got them covered. Exactly. It's time to build stuff. Maybe. Yay, finally. <laughs> so, show me. Well, no, we're not showing because the plan was for me, yeah, to, for well... Louise to show this, but something went wrong with the computer two minutes before the demo start. Right. Yeah, so that is the proof that this is actually happening live, dear kids at home. Um, but actually, so um, you will cover this and uh, we'll scaffold our project out and I will talk about this um, and tell what actually we are doing by that and how this all works. So, so as tell you me might... what to type. <laughs> tell me what to so, type. What to type is Yo Teams. Yo Teams. And now so I that do. Is... Just enter. Enter. Because that is what we want to do. And we will be just like nicely greeted. Um, welcome to Microsoft Teams app generator. We see this beautiful ASCII art and uh, we will now um, be prompted to um, um, answer some questions um, so that the um, Yeoman Teams generator knows which kind of um, project it shall scaffold for us. And uh, what you're already doing right now is doing the right thing. Um, we have a nice uh, solution name, so it's built you, obviously. We're using the current folder. Uh, the company name is Conto, so we know which manifest version we want to use. Um, you're using uh, non-quick uh, scaffolding. I would. Um, I would do that because um, it shows in the learn module that it does so, but we want to have this as a tab and um, the other questions will be answered with a no. Um, yes, we do want to have ESLint support um, and the next uh, thing is we want to have the tab configurable. That is pretty cool. And we do want to have this in a group chat because that meeting is a group chat. So we do not want to have this in a channel, the tab, so we can uh, build applications for tabs and channels, but we want to create an application that lives inside of a Teams meeting. Okay, 
So now your team knows which kind of application we want to build. And you might have noticed, and Yannick will scroll up a little bit in a second, um, that there were some values that look about wrong. So what really looks wrong is it asks us, hey, what is the application ID to associate with the SSO tab? That looks wrong because it's only zero. So it's eight times zeros, four times zeros, four times zeros, four times zeros, and then 12 times uh, zero. So that looks about wrong. And you can, if you are already familiar with development, imagine that we will here create a file and that we can change this value later on. So this is why he just like I hit next, next, next. Uh, or went on through the next question, but we will need to change this. Um, also, the uh, next question, what is the application ID URI to associate with that um, SSO um, tab? That also looks wrong right now because, as Yannick already explained, we will need to tunnel um, for development purposes. And right now, we do not host anything on uh, Azure and we want to have um, our code locally available and still be able to access um, the team's client with our code. So we will need to do that. Um, and to proceed here, we will just wait until your teams um, generated the file for us. And after it's completed, we will have a look at the files that were generated. Well, so in the sake it, of time, it's, it's I feel... Working. <laughs> It's working and for the sake of time, I don't think we cover this. So um, what your teams does is generate and scaffold the whole um, tooling. So if you see, you see that it created already a set of files um, available. And part of this is where you uh, put in all of the code to create your application. Yeah, so, so, the, well, so the project is scaffolded. All that needs to be done right now, it runs npm install to install all the dependencies. That takes a little while, but the entire scaffolding process is quickly, quickly done. Yeah, so it needs to get all of the packages out of um, the package manager. Now, ooh, let's hide this again. <laughs> um, so we see um the manifest file let's quickly cover this so this is a pre-populated file based on your input in your teams and you can of course adjust it later so if you do this you will see that there are some parts in this um uh, manifest file and it basically describes the functionality of your application so it got basic info on the application it got the icons because icons are important so that you can recognize your application it has the information about your configurable tabs. This is where your apps, your app will appear. So it has the configuration URL. This will go to the place where you will host your application. And then the scopes where your app can run inside Teams and the context and meeting services where your app can be made available. So you see here already the meeting chat app, the details tab, the side panel, and the stage. Basically, the places or the contextual places that we covered before. Then there's, of course, what permissions the app will need because it will do some functionality and then the web application info. We were planning, well, no. So configurable tabs in terms of the context um, as like your meeting chat app, your meeting details tab, your side panel and your stage. So we saw that before the meeting chat app is uh, a tab in the header of a group chat. So your app can run in the group chat of your meeting. In the details tab, which is basically when your um, calendar item is created, we saw side panel and stage when we ran through uh, the demo. Important note, you can't run an in-meeting app on mobile or on Teams room clients. And during development, you can only run this in a Teams desktop client. It does not work in the browser either. That means that usually we run stuff in a developer tenant or in a special environment and that you need to log out of your production tenant or you need to log into a special machine to do exactly that. So it is slightly inconvenient, but um, still it's possible. We were normally going to run you through the app registration, but that will take too long. So I will just show you the important parts. Important parts of 
an app registration in Azure Active Directory is the part where you give your application some API permissions. We take chat and that read is and beautiful, online... right? <laughs> and we give it chat read and online meetings read, so that it can read the users' online meetings and the chat messages because of the functionality that we want to create. And in terms of uh, an API, because we will also do an API, we have to expose an API inside of our application. This API has a couple of parts that are super important. It has an application ID URI, and by default, it will do this without the URL of your in-meaning application. But because of the quirks in Microsoft Teams, or the requirements, so to say, it requires <laughs> the application ID to be of this format, which means it needs the actual URL of your in-meeting application, so where it is hosted, inside the application ID URI, otherwise it will not work. Besides that, you need to expose a scope. So I've got a scope, it's called access as user. It also has to be called access as user. You, you will... can't name it anything else, right? You can't name it anything else. And then we're authorizing two client applications as when the call comes from one of these two client applications to the uh, API, this will mean these client applications are trusted and the users will not be asked to consent this API. So they will not get the annoying pop-up to say, I accept that this API will call the meeting or call the scopes on my behalf. And you've got the GUIDs, so it's super uh, user-friendly. You've got the GUIDs <laughs> over here of the desktop client in Teams and of the mobile client of Teams. And if you put those in with the scope, the one scope that we exposed, this will allow for um, SSO access into the uh, application. And then it's, of, of, the, uh, of course, important that we update the manifest file. So you see here, same thing goes in here. In the web application info, you put the ID of your app registration and you put the um, API resource that you just created. Then Teams knows when to um, where to request an access token. So how does it work, Louisa, the access oh, token? Oh, wow. So well, the access token. So the big, big question is always, where do I get that token from? So we run uh, the Teams of client code and it's using the Teams JS SDK. And we get an SSO token that is only an ID token. And we can't use that to retrieve any data from Graph API. It's just to tell me, so who am I? But I'm not allowed to do anything. And with that token that I already got from Teams, I will request, um, I will request server side, um, not a token, and that will just like directly lead to Azure Active Directory, where my identity is of course chosen, and I will exchange that ID token that I already have against an access token that I want to retrieve. And Azure Active Directory will then of course check, um, am I who I am supposed to be, and will then return this access token to me, and then in the server, I will request with this new access token that I got, the uh, data that I want to retrieve from the API, and in this case, it's the Graph API, which sits behind the entire M365 uh, suit and gives me uh, the code of uh, the, um, the, um, the data back that I want to have. And in our case, it's the online meeting uh, that I desperately need because I want to do something with that, right, Yannick? Right. So this is the code in the API backend. It's a big bunch of code. Um, you will see this in the end meeting. There is one, there are two things that I want to really cover um, is when you hit this endpoint, which is your own API, you will have to validate the token, the ID token that you get from Teams to make sure that it is meant for your API so that no random token gets can get used to call your API. And then you use that token to call the um, access token for the online meetings read and chat or read. And that's it. So if you got all that, that, that detail, all of those details and you got your access token, you can then call the graph for that. Okay, we will skip the knowledge checks. No, but it is highly great. encouraged for all attendees of this uh, um, of this uh, learn module here to uh, do the knowledge checks uh, when you go back to the learn module.
Yeah, for sure, because it will help you understand if you um, get what you just read and tried out um, exactly. in your application. So we already got the meeting lifecycle, right? We learned about this. So it's now important that we create separate UX for that. And it's a funny thing, right? With this meeting lifecycle. The it is a super funny thing because how would we know when to display what or in which case to display which UX? Well, that's a challenge because only in meeting is when we know that we're actually in the meeting because then the team's JavaScript SDK will tell us that the context of our application is either the side panel or the stage. In terms of pre-meeting and post-meeting, we will get content back. Yeah, that does not really help, which means we will have to use the uh, start date and end date of a meeting to determine if we're pre-meeting or post-meeting. And then we can uh, create a unique experience in terms of the stage. So to determine current meeting context and lifecycle, this is the code that we will use. When we use the Teams JavaScript SDK and get the context, you can check whether you're a side panel and load the side panel UX, whether you're in the meeting stage and load the meeting stage UX, or whether you're in the content. And this is where we check using the start date time or the uh, end date time to see if we go for the pre-meeting UX or the meeting stage UX. Remember with the meeting stage UX, no interaction was possible anyway. So we can easily use this as the post-meeting experience as well. In terms of roles, this is where the stuff gets interesting because normally the fun. this is the fun part because this is the, the thing that is currently broken in the application. Um, normally, Louise, you know this, you have mm -hmm. to create a bot to get yeah. the meeting details from Microsoft Graph. Now, I decided to be confident and creative and I tried to not do a bot. So I created a... I, I would I, say I, you were more lazy to not create that bot, but to find just like a super hacky workaround so that you are not required to have this bot, right? Yeah, it's a super, hack, super hacky workaround. And that basically means that it is now broken. It's the risk of using a super hacky workaround to avoid creating a bot. So what did I learn? That I can get the chat ID from the Teams JavaScript SDK. So I know which chat ID is related to my meeting. If I then use that chat ID to go Microsoft Graph, I get this information about the chat. The important thing is here, join web URL. It has a URL to join the meeting that's associated with, it, with this chat. So what did I learn? You can get the online meeting details by doing a query to um, Microsoft Graph and filter on join web URL for the value that you um, got before. And then you get all of the information of the online meeting. And the important part here is start date time and end date time, because that's what we wanted to use to create our meeting context. So see, everything worked out fine. This works amazing as an organizer. Great. What about if I'm not an organizer, but what if you added me as an attendee to that meeting? Well, this used to work six months ago, but now something was updated and this is what you get with a workaround. It no longer works for the attendee or presenter. So it only works for the organizer. A ticket has been locked and it has been investigated by Microsoft. But at this point, unfortunately, there is no solution yet. So. Which means that you will still need to have the bot. You will still need to have the bot to have all of this information. Another thing that's pretty interesting here is the, um, fact that you get all the attendees back from the online meeting. So you can see here all the participants that can only be one organizer mm -hmm. and you see which role the organizer has, and then you have all the attendees and you can see which role each of those attendees has. You see, I have one presenter and one attendee and the producer role is specifically for live events and, uh, webinars, I think. Exactly. And then you can use that to like, make yeah, sure test your knowledge you get, as well. <laughs> oh, let, let's test our knowledge. 
Let's see. Let, let, let's do one of these. So the question, dear audience, dear kids at home is, what are the different roles of attendees in a meeting that custom apps can use in creating unique experience for attendees? Is it A, organizer, presenter, and attendee? Is it B, organizer and attendee? Or is it three, presenter and attendee? And you can vote at the QR code that we write just like here, or vote at aka.ms slash false dash capital D. I think I know. You think you know? So uh, yeah. thinking about this, so um, you could approach this by numbers and say, will it be three or will it be two? Because so most probably, so we covered this already, we talked about it, we showed it in code, we showed it on the slide, we showed it in screenshots. So there was already, so this uh, information was already presented a lot. But um, what's your guess and why is that, Yannick? Well, my guess is, of course, that it, it must be A, because we got the organizer, the presenter, and the attendee role, which um, we even just learned that there is a fourth role. Uh, specifically for live webinars or for live events and webinars. So yeah. the producer role. So it must be A, right? Let's check and validate um, if that's okay. And the slides are stuck again. That's whoop. Woo! It looks green. So it looks, Yannick, as um, if you knew. Um... <laughs> what are the uh, different roles and I hope that a lot of attendees got that right as well which means that we would have done a good job at explaining that oh I was too fast so how does it were... have display content yeah hmm. this is what you get when the PowerPoint slides get stuck right and then you click again and then you show the and then you reach the... click and then you click again of course so this um I, I think you're not the first one to whom this happens, um, but I think it's still valuable to read one time through this. So how does a meeting app display content in the meeting stage? A, it would be B, apps manifest must include the meeting stage in the tab's contents array. Or it is the tab renders content when the Microsoft Teams context.frame context property equals site panel. Or a meeting attendee with the appropriate role selects the present button in the meetings apps site panel. And of course, the answer is all of these are correct. Because, yeah, because yes, uh, we have we have a requirement on the manifest. And yes, the tab renders the context where it says site panel. And of course, the meeting attendee needs to click that button. Yeah, amazing because like content does not get shown automatically on your screen, right? Um, it's exactly. difficult enough with sharing your screen. So luckily we've got this easy present button in a meeting app. Exactly. And this brings us to the end of this um, module. And I think we learned quite a lot, right? So first of all, we, I think, I now finally understand the capabilities of Microsoft Teams meetings and the extensibility, but we also learned that today at Build, new stuff was announced. So this means I will have work to do tomorrow to get up to speed again with everything that's newly available. Exactly. So secondly, we learned that um, creating a Teams meeting app can just like enhance the experience pre, uh, during, and post that meeting. And it's not three different applications, but we will just present uh, three different UX. And we are also showed how that works and that only the in-meeting um, experience is um, is shown by context. So we, we, we can only define this by the context of that meeting. And for everything else, we need to uh, compare timestamps and say, okay, is this a pre or post um, the um, start or end date of uh, that supposed meeting? Then, of course, um, fetching these this contextual meeting information and use that to create a better experience. Of course, this sounds like, again, like a little bit more marketing-y, but still it's just like super valuable to understand that the right context to the right people in the right um, and the right content, that is actually what delivers value in Microsoft um, in meeting apps. Yes, and we learned today that it's best to not take shortcuts and just use a bot because the shortcut recently stopped working, which is 
I think surprise, this is development surprise. life. <laughs> yes, surprise, surprise. This is what you get for being creative slash lazy. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you had fun. I know I did. So Louise, I hope you did too. And I did I as want well. To... Yeah, amazing. So then let's redirect our um, attendees again to the Learn Live module so they can build this code and this app themselves, which will work at least for the organizer of uh, a meeting for now. So you get the hang of it. And with that, and then... I would say thank you for attending the session. Um, I had fun. I hope that you got really, really cool stuff and that you enjoy Microsoft Build. And um, see you next time. See you next time. And don't forget, find us on Twitter, uh, see your blogs. We can and reach out to us if you have any questions with this learn module or with anything re related to Teams development. So, Louisa, thank you for being here and um, see you next time. Bye bye. Bye.